Okay, so now what we're going to do is talk about a type of investment called a bond. So uh, we talked in the past that an investment is basically, when we were talking about interest rates, we were saying an investment is basically a type of an agreement where you pay money at the beginning phase and receive money at the ending phase. Once you start receiving money, you don't have to pay any more money. So that's technically a, a, uh, an investment. And there's a special, uh, a bond can be a special type of investment where it keeps producing. The payment stream that comes out to you is constant. And I sometimes refer to that as a fixed income investment. Okay, so just a, a little quick reminder, we went over uh, interest rates. Um, so suppose, for example, that, you know, we talked about interest rates and present value, and present value is future value. So suppose Abby needs money from you right now. And Abby knows she's going to have $5,000 five years from now that she'll give to you. And she wants to get as much money out of you now as she can. Uh, banks are currently paying an interest rate of 11%. How much money should you lend her today? So, for example, you could take your money and put it in the bank. Or you could take your money and give it to Abby, who for some reason you're counting on will be around five years from now and will pay you back. So what would be a good amount for you to pay today? We could use our present value, future value formula and just say $5,000 in the future, discounted back five years worth of interest at 11% would come out to $2,967 if you did the computation. So if you gave her this much money today and she gave you $5,000 five years from now, it's like you're getting 11% per year. Right, so that's just a little reminder. You haven't seen interest rates in a while. Okay, so what then is a bond? A bond is a debt security which, uh, in which the authorized issuer owes the holders uh, a debt, depending on the terms of the bond, is obligated to pay an interest rate, which they call a coupon rate, um, and or repay the principal at a later date, term of maturity. So there's a point in time where this agreement is going to end. You don't have the money owed to you forever. Um, then another definition would be a bond is a formal contract to repay borrow money at a fixed, uh, over fixed intervals. Okay. So here's just a picture of a bond. So this is an example. Okay, so now one thing about bonds is a bond is a person, in general, a bond is saying one person is giving money to another person or it could be a company and it's they're getting a promise that they will be repaid a stream of money later. Could be one payment, could be many payments. And they're going to receive money back over a period of time. So the bond, obviously nobody's going to lend money and not get anything extra besides the money they lent. They're lending it so they can get interest back. The bond will have an interest rate stated on it. So for example, this is one from the Chrysler Corporation from 1982. The bond rate is seven and seven eighths percent, and this bond—I don't know if you can see this—is a twenty-five thousand dollar bond. So a person. So this would be an example where the Chrysler Corporation needs to raise money. Maybe they want to build a new factory and make a new type of car. So they could issue millions of dollars worth of these bond certificates out, and people will voluntarily say, "Okay, I will give you." 25, I'll give Chrysler $25,000, they're going to give me an interest rate of 8.78%, uh, and then uh, the note ended up being, the, the due date on this bond could be, I can see the due date on this, but it could be, let's say, 10 years from now. So there's a number of ways in which this bond could pay the 8 and 7 8 percent interest. One would be they just pay one big payment at the end. Right? We've done that computation before. That would be like you give $25,000 today and then we just tack on 10 years worth of interest and 10 years from now you pay, could be $50,000 or something like that. And that'd be an implied interest rate of eight and seven eighths percent. Another way, some people might not want to wait 10 years to get their money back. Some people might want some of the money now. So another payment stream, or could you think of any payment streams? You, any other way that, that the Chrysler Corporation would pay its bondholders the money back? 
Obviously, one way is just wait till the thing matures, which could be 10 years from now. Figure out what all the interest is and make one big payment at the end. Is there any other way? Annual or semi-annual coupon payments. Okay. So, well, another way would be kind of like a reverse of a mortgage where you're paying every month and then at the last month you're done because you've divided up the payments over that much time. Another thing would be just to pay the interest component. Let's say the eight and seven eighths every year, like at the end of the year. And then at the end of the last year, you just give the original $25,000 back because you've been paying, the Chrysler Corporation has been paying the payments each year. So it wouldn't be like the interest is accruing because each year they pay off the interest. So the balance ends up saying $25,000. So now you said coupon. So where... Uh, so like, so it's going to be um, $25,000 times the uh, 8... Whatever they post as the interest rate. Yeah. That's so, what be. Right, it'll be the amount of the what they call the par value, the original amount of $25,000, the original amount the bond purchaser gave to Chrysler Corporation, and then you just calculate what the interest is times that number, and that payment comes out, let's say, at the end of each year. But uh, do you know why it's called a coupon rate? Because they used to give, like, little coup like bearer bonds, like... Yeah, so bonds. what they used to do, this, I, I wanted to find one that has this, but you know, like, when you see around campus, somebody's teaching you how to play guitar, and you, you rip off their phone number, right? There's, like, 20 little things you can rip off that... So, bonds used to have things like that, little coupons on the bottom, and you'd rip one off, and then you'd send it in, and they would send you the money. But then when computers came around, they got rid of that concept. But bonds used to have coupons on the bottom. And let's say for 10 years, you'd have 10 coupons, you'd pull off the coupon and then say, give me my 8.78 times 25%, and they'd mail it to you. Or you'd, if it was a, one in a bank, you could go down to the bank and cash in your coupon. So to this day, it's still called the coupon rate. So this 8 and 7 eighths is called the coupon rate. So this is an example of a Chrysler bond. The par is $25,000. That's the amount the investor originally gives to Chrysler. The coupon rate, the amount you receive every year, is 8 and 7 eighths. And it's also very common that the coupon is paid two times a year. Sometimes they pay it every six months. So now you're taking the 8 and 7 eighths and dividing it in half and paying that much two times a year. And that's kind of where we, we were talking about the interest rates if you're making two payments instead of one payment, what would the amount be? Okay, so that ends up being what the coupon rate is. So we could have a bond that is called a zero coupon rate, meaning you just get one big amount at the end. And that's just like the payments we, we talked about before. So there are zero coupon bonds. If the bond has a coupon rate, it's implied that the interest is being paid every year and then the original amount you borrowed gets refunded at the end of the duration of this time. So what would be the motivation for somebody to issue a bond and what would be the motivation for somebody to buy a bond? Why would Chrysler issue bonds? They need money. And rather than go to a bank and borrow it, they would rather issue it to people to just voluntarily give them money. And this way they don't have to make monthly payments like a mortgage where they're making big payments. They're making very little payments and then 10 years later, hopefully whatever they're doing with the money, they can build a factory and start making cars and then make so much money it's no problem paying this money back. And why would somebody buy one? Because they have $25,000 and they like this interest rate. It's better than what they'll get at a bank. Now here's the problem. What if Chrysler goes out of business in the next 10 years? That big $25,000 payment may not come back. So you're taking a bigger risk by buying a company's bond than putting in a bank that's federally insured, but you're getting, going to get a much better interest rate. So you might be care about you know, how stable is this company. And then there are bond rating companies, we'll talk about a little bit later, which will tell you Chrysler is a big risk or Chrysler is a small risk, and then you kind of know how much risk is involved and what the percentage is, and you make a decision what you want to buy. And you might want to buy a mixture of bonds. So that way, if one company goes out of business, you don't lose all your money. <laughs> but that's for like a bond portfolio management course. Okay, so if we had an example of a zero coupon bond, that means, a zero coupon bond means you give money on the first day, and they give you one big check on the last day. There's no payments along the way. So a zero coupon bond would be something like this. Let's say, for example, we had a par of $1,000. 
The annual interest rate is 5%. It lasts for exactly two years. What are your payouts? Well, it's zero coupon, so there's only one big payment at the end. And it's 5% for two years, so we tack on 5% interest two times, and we get $1,010.25. That's what you'll get two years from today. So that would be the payout, the cash flow of that particular bond. Now let's do a coupon bond. Suppose we had a coupon bond that said um, the PAR is $1,000, the bond says the uh, interest rate is 5%, the duration is two years, what, was your, what would your payouts be? One year from today, this will, oh, so this would, I should have said this is a, uh, a and, oh, it is an annual coupon. Okay, not biannual coupon. Okay, so this is an annual coupon, which means one year from today you will receive $5, Oh, $50. Yeah. yeah, i got to change that. Okay, <laughs> you'll receive $50. And then two years from today, you'll receive $50 plus your original $1,000 back. Okay. So this is your cash flow for this investment. So you pay $1,000 today, you get $50 next year, and then $1,050 the following year, and then you're done with this investment. And that has an internal rate of return of 5%. Okay, so the formula for coupon bonds is basically this. If you have N payments, and then finally at the end you get one big balloon payment, you get your money back, how much, uh, what's the formula for the price of the bond? Well, you know what the coupon is, it's the same coupon every time. And then you're getting the coupon after one year, you're getting the coupon after two years, all the way up to n years, and then you're getting the big payment at the end. So if you wanted to know what is a bond worth today, what would you pay for a bond today if its future stream of payments was, and you could, you could figure out what the, the payments are. So you can figure out what the bond is worth. You could calculate what it would currently sell for. So let me just give an example of what I mean by that. And that you might be thinking, first of all, why, if we have a coupon rate, right, C is the annual coupon payment, isn't that the interest rate? Why do we have an interest rate and a coupon rate? Would they be the same thing? Does it, does it cause confusion or does it make sense that they would be two different things? So for example, that Chrysler bond had a coupon rate of eight and seven eighths percent. And let's say somebody bought that bond for 10 years, but four years later they want to get rid of it. And interest rates have changed since it was originally bought. So the coupon rate and the current interest rate might be different. And so for example, if interest rates have gone way down, let's say you can only get 3% from a current bond, someone who has a bond that pays 8%, that would be very valuable. You'd like to have that. So the price of that bond would go up if interest rates go down. And if interest rates shot way up to like 20%, then an 8% bond isn't worth much because it's not paying too much. So this rate is the current rate, and the coupon is the coupon that was originally printed on the original bond. That doesn't change over time. So let's say we wanted to price a retail bond. So suppose six years ago, Someone bought a ten bought a ten year coupon bond and would like to get rid of it now. On the bond, it's printed that it pays seven percent per year, and then eventually you get the one thousand dollars back. If it's a one thousand dollar par value bond, so it matures in exactly four years. Right? They bought a ten year bond. They've already had it for six years. They've already received six years worth of payments, but there's still four more years worth of payments to come and that big final payment at the end. They want to sell this thing to you right now. So if you take over this bond, about to register your name that you're now the bond holder. So you go to your bond trader and they'll do that for you. What would you pay this person today to have the name registered from them to you? So how would we calculate what a bond is a bond that is now like in the retail market, meaning it was, it's not being sold by Chrysler, it's being sold by the guy who bought it from Chrysler six years ago, he's now selling it to you. <clears throat> so the question is, what is the bond's market price? Well, you're going to get 
one year from now, you're going to get $70 two years from now, you're going to get $70 three years from now, you're going to get $70 four years from now, plus you're also going to get the original $1,000 that he put in, also four years from now. What is that all equal to today, in today's money? So if you add up that whole payment stream and say, what is that equal in today's money, this calculation came out to be $1,071. So this guy is asking for, he's asking you to pay $1,071 today, and what you're going to get in return is $70 for the next four years and then the original $1,000 back. But this ends up being the fair price for that payment stream. So this person might be selling this, you know, if you're talking about markets, they might be saying, I'd like to sell it for 171 or some number higher than that, and you might bid, well, 170 or some number lower than that. And if the two of you meet in the middle, it might sell for a price like that. So you'd want to be able to calculate any bond that is now in the retail market, not being offered by a company like Chrysler or Coca-Cola, but being offered by somebody who bought it a while back, and they're halfway through the period that the bond is issued for and they want to sell it. You know, the prices are constantly changing. It wouldn't make sense that the price would always be a thousand dollars and the reason is because interest rates change. The bond is paying seven percent but the, the current interest rate in the world might be lower than that or higher than that. So what would cause this to be higher than the par value? Why is this higher than a thousand dollars? The coupon rate is better than the current rate, so this is an attractive bond. If the coupon rate was lower than the current interest rate, then the, nobody wants to get stuck with this. This would end up being like $950, you know, something in that neighborhood. Okay. So that's the retail side of the bonds. Okay, so now this is just the definition on bonds, like a yield to maturity. So we have the coupon rate, which we already said before, is the average payout as a percentage of the bond's par value. So that's the amount the bond is paying per year until the end. The current yield would be the annual percentage of the payout divided by the market price that you actually paid for it. So in the last example, we would have paid $1,071 for a bond and we'd be receiving $70 per month. So if you want to know how much, am I, I'm sorry, per year, if you want to know how much money am I receiving per year from my initial investment, it would be 70 divided by 1,071, which would be a little bit less than 7%. So from the point of view of somebody saying, I'm putting up money today, what percentage of, the amount of that am I going to receive each year? This would end up being a little bit less than 7%. The final yield to maturity would be a composite rate of the return of all payments, coupons, and capital gains. So really, the only difference between the current yield and the yield to maturity is we'd have to take into account that on the, exa the last example, we're paying $1,071, but we're not going to get $1,071 at the end of the term. We're only going to get $1,000 back. So that extra $71 we lost, we have to calculate that into our loss. So that would end up being, the, the coupon rate in that example would be 7%. The current yield would be a little bit less than 7%. And then if you take that extra loss, of the fact that we're paying an extra $71 today, which we're not getting back four years from now, that, that gets calculated into the yield to maturity. So, I'll do one more example. Okay. So, just one more example of the yield to maturity. An investor purchases a $1,000 bond that matures in 25 years. 8% is the coupon rate. The price is currently, this is just like lingo, at 95, meaning 95% of the par value, which is $950. What is the yield to maturity, or the overall interest rate? So what we're doing in this case is we have to amortize the $50 that we got on the discount. So we're basically paying $950 today, receiving $80 per uh, year. But in addition to that, if you took the, the fact that we're paying $950 today but receiving 1000 at the end, that extra $50 we're getting divided by 25 years is like we're receiving an extra $2 per year. 
So we're really receiving like, it's like we're receiving $82 a year divided by, and now we ended up get it, taking an average of um, the par value and the amount we paid for it and using that as a divider. So this is actually an approximation of what the interest rate of this investment is. So the only, this, this extra $2 came from the fact that we are getting $1,000 back. We're getting $1,000 back 25 years from now, but only putting up $950. So that extra gain of $50 spread out over 25 years is $2 per year. And now the thing is, what do we use as the denominator to figure out our percentage? Do we use the 950 or do we use the par value of 1,000? And it's popular to use an average of the two. And then we can end up saying this is an estimate for the yield to maturity. So this investment, which now has the cash stream of paying 950 now, receiving 80 per year, $80 per year, and then getting 1,000 at the end, the interest rate of this overall investment ends up being 8.42, uh, 8.41 percent. Can you just show me that two again? The two, okay, so, so like for, for example, if, let's, let's make the example easy. Let's say you paid $1,000 today, you get $80 a year, and then get $1,000 back at the end. The interest rate would be 8%, right. right? But now suppose the amount you pay today doesn't equal the amount you get at the end. We have to, so that's either a gain or a loss. Like the previous example, we paid... 1,071 today, but only receive 1,000 back at the end. We kind of lost $71 from that point of view, what we're paying now and what we're getting back. In this case, we're actually gaining $50, because we're laying out $950 now, but receiving 1,000 in the end. So it's, we are actually getting $80 per year, but if you took that $50, Divided by 25 years, it's like we're getting an extra two dollars oh, every year. Yeah. All right. Now, it's not exactly right. If you remember what we talked about with interest rates, it's not. It's that would be like taking two dollar steps for 25 years. If we did, if we use the number e, it would be a smoother curve, and it's not quite two dollars per year. Yeah, because when you discount that by like interest rate, you kind of. Or... Right. We would. Um, it's. If we calculate, it, it, yeah, what we're basically doing is treating that $50 that we're not calculating interest on it. We're just taking it and dividing it, saying $2 per year. Mm -hmm. But we're really getting a little bit less than $2 in the early years and a little bit greater than $2 in the later years. So that's why I'm saying this is kind of an approximate. And now the thing is, what would we use as the denominator? Like if if you laid out $1,000 today, and you, you would take the amount of money you receive each year and divide it by the amount of money you laid out, or would you divide it by the amount of money you will receive at the end? When they're not equal, we ended up taking, um, it's just popular in the financial world to use an average of the two. Taking the average of the 950 and the 1,000 and using seven, 975 as the denominator. But like I say, this is an estimate. It's very close to the actual number, but it is an estimate for the interest rate of this cash flow. And it's just a cash flow created by buying somebody else's bond in the retail market. So if you wanted to know overall what interest rate is this investment getting, it would end up being approximately 8.41. Okay, so then just tying together the idea of the coupon rate, the current yield, and then the yield to maturity. So just a, a reminder, if the par value, if the bond is currently selling for the par value, maybe I should have put this as the first one, if it's selling at par, that means you're paying $1,000 today for a bond that's going to return $1,000 some, at some point in the future. The reason why the par value today would match the par value of the future is the interest rate of this bond exactly matches the current interest rate. So if the coupon rate matches, uh, I'm sorry, if, if it's selling at par, that means the coupon rate matches the current interest rate, which means the coupon rate will equal the yield, which will equal uh, the current yield and the yield to maturity. The yield is basically how much you laid out today divided by what you receive every year, not taking into account the difference between the purchase price and the par. Yield to maturity just adds in that extra $2. The, 
the yield to maturity takes into account the difference between what you paid and what you're going to receive. So if you're buying the bond at a discount, meaning you're paying less than what the par will return at the end, then the coupon rate would be lower than the yield. That makes sense because the coupon is paying a certain amount, but the yield is going to be bigger than that because we're paying less today and getting more in the future. So we're getting a little bit more than what the coupon says. And then, uh, I'm sorry, because the denominator ends up being a number less than in the, in the case of $1,000 bonds, maybe we pay nine fifty for the bond and we're still receiving the par of 8%, so we're getting a little bit more than 8%. Then if you take into account the difference between what we're paying today and what we're going to receive in the future, we get even more money. So that causes the coupon rate to be less than the current yield and to be less than the yield to maturity. So for example, we might have a coupon rate of 8%, but we're paying $950 for a bond that's going to give us $1,000 in the future. So the current yield will be a little bit higher than 8%, maybe like 8.2, because we didn't pay $1,000, we paid $950. And then if you take into account the extra $50, we get to amortize that over time. That calculates into the current uh, the yield to maturity. If we're buying the bond in the, dis in the retail market at a premium, meaning we're paying more than the current, face, uh, the current par value, that obviously is the case where the current interest rates are uh, lower than the coupon. That means this is a valuable bond, so we're paying a premium. The coupon rate is higher than the current interest rates, which means that the coupon rate is more than the yield, because we're, we're actually laying out more than $1,000 just to get our hands on this bond. So the current yield would end up being lower than that, and then if you take into account that we're paying extra today and receiving less than that in the future, would make the yield to maturity low. So this is just a common um, rule of thumb for discount bonds, premium bonds, and then bonds that are selling exactly at par. So you'll always hear on the, on the financial news channels, they'll say if interest rates go up, bond prices go down, and if interest rates go down, bond prices go up. Because the bonds are, have already have an established coupon rate. Bonds have their own rate, and then the current world has its, an interest rate that's constantly going up and down. So if interest rates drop, then if you have a bond with a high interest rate, that's worth more now. So bond prices go inversely with the current interest rate. So then the question was, if you decided you wanted to buy a bunch of bonds, which ones would you buy? And you might think, oh, I'd like to buy a Chrysler bond. I think Chrysler will be around 10 years from now, but you're not an expert. But there are companies that you know, have people who are experts in the field of rating bonds. And two of the most famous ones is a company called Moody's and a company called Standard & Poor's. <coughs> and they could use any system. They could use 1 to 10 or A, B, C, D, any system they want. <laughs> they decided to use this system of their top quality bonds for Moody's is a big A followed by two little A's, and Standard & Poor's uses triple A. The next best thing is double A, then single A, then triple B, and so on. And if these rating companies rate your company bonds as being, let's say, triple A, then people will like buying them knowing there's a very, very little chance that you'll default on it. They feel they're going to get their money back. What's good if you're running a company, what's good to have a very high bond rating is you don't have to give out such a high interest rate because everyone feels safe with your bonds. If you have a big risk of not paying back, then the question is, how are you going to get people to buy your bonds when they could buy some other company's AAA bonds? So let's say, for example, a company like Coca-Cola. They always have a very high rating because what would have to happen for Coca-Cola to go out of business? People would have to stop getting thirsty, right? You know, or some new flavor, some other soda company invents a new flavor and no one wants to buy Coke anymore. It's not very likely Coca-Cola is going to go out of business 10 years from now. So you could buy a Coca-Cola bond and be pretty sure it's going to be around 10 years from now. But what if it's some much smaller company? Suppose you run a much smaller company and you're trying to get people to buy your bond. You know, people have money to invest. You want them to buy your bond instead of Coca-Cola. What would you have to do if your company is a lot more risky? Let's say your company got rated a, a lower rating. What would you have to do to get people to buy your bond instead of Coca-Cola? You'd have to give them a higher rate, because you're a higher risk. So they'll say, all right, 
Coca-Cola is giving me 5%, you're giving me 7 I might lose my shirt with you, but I would like the idea of getting an extra 2%. I'll take my chances. Now, nobody's going to put their whole life savings in one company. So people who go out and invest in bonds, they might say, I want, they'll go to a bond manager and they'll say, I want 50% to be top quality and 25% to be, you know, pretty good quality. And I want to make a little, I'll take a chance, do some of these lower junk bond ratings. You know, these might be paying 10, 12%, but there's a good chance you might not get your money back in the end, but you might be able to get your money back too and just get a better rate because you took a chance. So depending on how much you want to risk and how much you want to gain will determine how to uh, invest your money. And then one last topic, just while we're on the topic of bonds, this won't really come up too much in this course, but it'll come up in other courses, is the concept of a bond's duration. So I got this definition over Wikipedia. So of duration, not a bond's duration, in finance, Duration of a financial asset. So they call it financial asset instead of investment. Financial asset means basically something that has a cash flow. And investment is a particular type where they, the numbers start off negative and switch to positive. But a financial asset that consists of fixed cash flows, for example, a bond. And it's a weighted average of its time until these fixed cash flows are received. So this sounds like a little bit of a strange definition, but I think through an example it would make more sense. So let's go over a really simple example. We know now we have a zero coupon bond. Its current price is five hundred dollars. Ten, ten years from now you will receive a thousand dollars. Two questions: What is the interest rate and what is the duration? You know, you might think, well, why are you even asking what the duration is? So let's first do the interest rate. The interest rate is five hundred dollars today, plus. Um, interest for 10 years equals a thousand. Let's solve for R. We solve for R, I think I used Excel to do this. We solve for R and the interest rate ends up being 7.17%. So you could say to somebody, I'm buying this bond and it's paying me 7.17%. Then someone might say, okay, how long do you have this bond for? How long of a period are you receiving 7.17%? And just by looking at this, you're receiving it for 10 years. So the duration of this bond is 10 years. Now, suppose we look at this example. And this, hopefully this de demonstrates the idea of duration. We have it's almost the same exact example. We have a zero coupon bond. The current price is $500, just like before. 10 years from now, you receive $1,000, just like before. But one new rule, 20 years from now, you get an extra penny. So it's almost exactly the same as last time except that 20 years from now you get a penny. What is this bond's interest rate and what is its duration? This is basically the same problem as the previous slide except for the extra penny. Did the penny cause a notable change in the interest rate? I mean obviously I did this on purpose. There's no real world bond like this. I'm just trying to illustrate, does this bond, add, you know, so if that penny didn't really change the interest rate, and it doesn't, it's just one penny on a $500 investment, so that would be, you know, at the, at the end of the final payment, it would be one ten thousandth of the price, so it really doesn't affect it. If the penny doesn't affect the interest rate, does it now cause this bond to last 20 years? Would you say this bond lasts 20 years? with this new rule? Yes. Uh, we do get yeah. a coupon, which is really small. Uh, wait, no, this is a zero coupon bond. Oh, so basically, oh, yeah. it's just like the last one. You're paying $500 today, 10 years from now you're getting $1,000. So there is an, an internal rate of return. There's an interest rate involved. We calculated last time to be 7.17. The only thing new is 20 years from now, you're getting an extra penny. And I picked the number of penny to be so, you know, the most insignificant amount of money you can get, but yet you're receiving something. Would you make the argument that the person who owns the previous bond is getting 7.17% for 10 years, but this, the person who owns this bond is getting what? 
7% for 20 years? Is this person's bond lasting twice as long as the previous person? Or is this almost identical to the previous person? And the, this penny is just confusing us. It's making us think it's lasting twice as long, and it's really not. Well, what's like just from a you know commenting? What what does this seem like? Does this does it seem like this bond lasts longer? Technically, it lasts twice as long because you get that extra penny ten years later. But would you if you were if you were at a company and you were a bond portfolio manager? So a portfolio is just a collection of investments. If you were managing and your boss said we need to throw into our basket of bonds, we need a bond that Get, is getting 7.17% and it's got to last at least 20 years based on a schedule for what we want to do for the next 20 years you need to go find one if you found this bond would you say this is going to give us 7.17% for 20 years I mean technically it, its duration is 20 years because you, it takes 20 years for this thing to close out but the last 10 years was just waiting around for this one pen this is really a bond that has a duration of 10 years. The penny makes it seem like it's 20 years, but it's not. So this would be considered equivalent to a bond that makes 7.17 and only lasts 10 years, even though this, the payment stream is lasting 20 years. The, we want to take a weighted average of the payment stream to figure out what is it, what is it equivalent to. So, um, suppose we had a coupon bond. That's, so that last example was just something for us to think about. But now suppose we had a coupon bond. Current price is $1,000. You receive $60 per year. Right? It's a coupon. You get $60 each year. And then at the end of 10 years, you get your $1,000 back. Same two questions. What is the interest rate and what is the duration? Well, the interest rate we can see with our eyes is 6%. Right? Because you're getting $60 on a thousand. How long does it last? You might jump out and say it lasts 10 years. It actually lasts 10 years if you receive one big payment at the end. We're kind of getting little payments along the way. So this is not quite the same as something that paid 6% for 10 years because it's kind of cashing us out a little bit along the way. This is like the example before where we get this penny at the end. We really care about the weight of each payment and when the payment came in. So in this case, I think because the, the, the dur well, in this case, I'm just leaving this example saying the duration of this bond is a little bit less than 10 years. This would, the, so the gain from, for our company's point of view would be like if we had a 10, I'm sorry, a 6% bond for maybe nine years. Because we're not getting all the money at the end. We're getting payments along the way, and then the part that's paying us is not compounding interest. So this might be equivalent to a bond that pays 6% but lasts 9 or 9 and a half years, something like that. It's not equivalent to a bond that lasts a full 10 years. To gain 6% for 10 years, you would have to lay out the money at the beginning and receive all the money at the end. If you're getting payments along the way, it's weakening the duration of the bond. So it's not quite as good as having a bond that lasts 10 years and pays 6%. <clears throat> so, and then just while we're still on the topic of this, there's a person named Matt Carley's um, duration calculation. And basically, the value of a bond is basically equal to the present value of all the payments. Add that all up, and that's the current value of a bond. So the duration of a bond is if you take the time, you take the weight of each payment divided by the total value of the bond, and then multiply that by the time at which it came. So you're basically taking a weighted average of the entire payment stream, and that ends up being what we're calling the bond's duration. Um, they had one. No, that was the last one. Sorry. Okay. So we could go over an example of this. The, a bond's duration, the concept of a bond's duration um, is basically, 
comes into play with bond portfolio managers. So you might have a bond portfolio and one of your bonds is about to expire, so you need to replace it with another bond, hopefully at the same, same interest rate or same yield. So you might say, okay, I have a bond that's about to expire. In other words, I'm going to get my par value back and I'm not going to gain any more interest. So I need to re go out to the market and replace it with a new bond making the same rate. It would, if I had two choices between, let's say, two bonds that pay 5% each, one had a duration of two years and one had a duration of three years, we might prefer the one that has a duration of three years because we're going to get that rate that much longer. So bonds that have payments along the way, not zero coupon bonds that have a payment at the end, but bonds that have payments along the way have a deceiving idea that if you start getting payments earlier, it actually reduces its duration. And I did that gross, grossly exaggerated example where we get one payment after 10 years and then another penny 20 years later, and we really don't care about the penny. So what we're really doing here, in this case, it would be like the one with the penny. We would say after 10 years, we're getting 99.999% of our money back, and after 20 years, we're getting 0.000% uh, of our money. And add those two numbers up, this would end up saying that bond is approximately last 10 years. It's not a 20-year bond. So this would end up being like, let's say the total value of our of that bond in that last example was a thousand dollars. No, they, they have that example go. We got it was 10 years. Oh yeah, we got a big chunk of money after 10 years, and then a penny after 20 years. So this would end up saying 10 times 0.99999 plus 20 times 0 0.0001, add that up, and it would come out to slightly more than 10 years. So the duration of that bond would be very, very slightly more than 10 years. It's not a 20-year bond. So you can't say, oh, I, just, I got myself a 7% interest rate for 20 years. No, you got it for about 10 years. And that's all this, this weighted average thing is. So now if you had a big series of payments, let's say you had a bond that paid half its value back after 10 years and another half after 20 years, it might have a duration of somewhere around 15 years. Because you're getting a big chunk after 10 years and another big chunk after 20. So that's where, so the two factors we're looking at, and if you think about it, that's actually what we went over, was it last class when we were talking about, we had a, an investment where you can pay $1,000 and get 3000 after five years or 5000 after seven years. The last. Yeah, so one had a better interest rate, but one had a better duration. Mm -hmm. And which is the better one? What do you care more about, the rate or the duration? Maybe you care about one more than the other. So bonds even have the concept of duration. Okay. So I think that's it for bonds. <laughs>